My name is Isaac Yanomoto. My talk is State, a Necessary Evil. Um, before I get start started, um, I want to give special thanks to Alvin De Los Santos and Chris Ertel, uh, who, without whom I wouldn't be here. Uh, and as of today, officially, I'm working for a company called Positron.ai. If you're interested in large language models running on hardware, uh, you come talk to me at some point in the thing. I'm also uh, branded myself as the rogue mercenary of Elixir, and if you're interested in that, I will be giving a lightning talk. So what is this talk? Oh, and thank you guys for attending. Um, so what, the purpose of this talk is to talk about how you store state in Elixir. And you know we're functional programmers, so that means state is like this bad thing. Uh, so what do I mean by state for this, for this talk? Um, it's something where your code has a side effect that is access and modify methods. So if you look at this little code block, you can see an example of what we're going to do. We're going to uh, execute a new function. It's going to give us some sort of token or reference. We can get against that reference and get back the data. We can put something different into it and then uh, change what's stored inside this token. Uh, and then we can execute the get again, and it gives you something different. So we're not talking about mutable variable bindings. Um, and you know, the first question is, doesn't mutable state have problems when you access them concurrently? And we know that the beam is a concurrent system. And the answer is yes, of course. All of these examples, except for one, which I'll talk about, have this exact problem. Um, so you, know, you got to be careful. Uh, the audience of this talk is everybody. There should be some stuff for beginners. Uh, and some stuff that ex for exports. So if there's some part that you feel is like beyond your, you know, your understanding, uh, don't worry, it's totally fine. And if there's something that you, know, is, you think is a little simple, wait a little bit. There'll be some more complicated stuff coming on. Great. So let's get started. First one, env. And this is going to be a whirlwind tour. There's going to be a lot of code. So get, get ready, buckle up. All right, so what is env? It's the system env. This is what I'm talking about right now. It is the operating system's per OS process env system. How does it work? There is a dedicated memory space when you launch your virtual machine, and it copies like very, like, very early to a privileged set of terms in the beam. Um, this is probably actually something that most people who have deployed real Elixir code have seen. Probably in your configuration, you run it once. But did you know that it's mutable? Uh, and it's string-based, so probably only store strings in this thing. So here's how we're going to test everything. We're gonna we've got this module here that has a string demo and an int demo. And it's going to execute all of those uh, code that I showed you in that little box before, except we've got, uh, we're going to io.inspect everything so you can see what happens as it goes along. And I'm going to pass the module in, and then we're going we're gonna to do the thing. So let me show you env. Basically, we're just going to store, we're going to create like some uh, uh, a demo key in our, in our uh, process environment. And uh, we're just going to store whatever string we want in there. So let's do this. Uh, and state. And as you can see, it works, right? So we, we, the reference is the string demo. The, uh, in the, the initial value is the string foo. We mutated it to bar. But here's the reason why this thing is kind of like super weird. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run a shelled command. So let's do uh, mvstate.run. And what happens, we can see that that, that like m variable has been stored and is accessible by some other program. So if you're shelling out to any programs and you're like mutably changing the state of, the, of, of, your, of your, env, your env table, weird things can happen, and it, you might not get what you expect. So be very careful with this. That's an ex export level pro tip. But for the beginners, you know that this, this is a thing, right? Um, OK, yeah, that's, that's env state. So having seen that, let's uh, put this in a tier list. This is F tier. It's not to say that system.env is a bad, bad, like, bad thing to use. You just shouldn't use it to store state. Please don't, because you can only do strings, and you, it'll just have weird, weird things can happen. You really know what you're doing when you're using system.env. OK, number two, ports. Uh, this is kind of like a very key primitive thing in the, in the, in the Erlang system. We've actually already used it in the, previous, in the, in the last demo. What it is is it, you spawn another uh, operating system process. Um, so that's like another uh, uh, executable. And to be fair, it is possible to write a port that is something that isn't actually running, uh, running an executable. But the way you do it is you just run port.command, 
and then it sends uh, data into the standard in of the external process, and it can send messages back via the standard out. And again, this is pretty much storing binaries. All right, so let's take a look at this. Here's the code. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into detail about it, but basically the get has to do a receive on this message that the, that the, that the port will create. So let's do this. And oops, well, that's weird. Uh, <laughs> but um, you, you can see the reference here is just uh, an actual data term called the port, right? Uh, that, that's got this like special port syntax because it's a little bit weird. Um, and then here we see the, uh, where did we get the initialized value foo and mutated value var. So it worked as we expected. Um, in this case, uh, I'm actually running a mixed task that I've already written inside this, um, inside this code and um, basically just sits on, on, on the standard in and standard out and like, just waits, uh, waits for the commands to go by. OK. Um, the code for this will be available on a GitHub, GitHub project. So having seen that, where do I put port? Uh, port is like a B tier. Um, you know, actually, the reason why I put a beard here is because it's kind of hard to deploy. So if you're, like, say, deploying in a container, where do you run? Where do you put this other application? You can also get zombie processes. So that's not, sometimes when something goes wrong, the, the executing program just kind of sticks around, even though you've stopped talking to it. Uh, and then that, that can be a resource problem. So, you know, not the best, but it's all right. Use it if, use it if you must. OK. The next one is sockets. So what is it? So these are network data streams that are managed by the operating system. This is how you talk over the internet. Um, one way it can work is to use Erlang's socket module, or you can use these really uh, more high-level modules called Gen TCP and Gen UDP, which wrap the um, TCP and UDP network protocols that uh, I, I think in some versions of the socket is built on top of, uh, on top of the socket module. In some versions of the Erlang VM, it's built on top of the socket modules. And in other versions, it's something different. You basically use connect to establish a connection. You send commands using send. And then you can re use receive to receive content back. So these are just functions on any one of these modules. You should follow whatever protocol exists for the counterparty. right? And so really, this sort of stuff is what is going way under the hood when you're doing an HTTP request or database access. And whatever, uh, whatever can be sent over sockets is what you can store, right? Uh, encoded as a, as a binary. Um, yeah, uh, let's take a look. So the first e example I have is doing this with uh, just the socket module in Erlang. So here we're going to open the socket uh, there, and then we're going to connect. In this case, what I, you ha don't see is that I've got a UDP server actually running inside of this, inside of this process. Um, it's going to go over this port, uh, and then it's going to send, uh, send a message. Um, uh, right, and then uh, and that, that send will just have the content. So the UDP port just says, hey, what did you give me? I'm going to store that. And then it returns a socket, which is, the, which is that token that re refers to the connection. Get is just sends this get command and uh, receive, and it waits for the response. All right, so let's, let's run this. And as you can see, um, the initialized value and mutated value are what we expect. But we get this like, weird like, tuple uh, with a socket and then this reference um, in it. So this is a unique term that is just this, like, this says, hey, this is the socket that I've opened up under the hood. Uh, we'll talk about references in a little bit. OK. Um, we can also uh, use one of the more higher level libraries. So this is basically the same thing except using the Gen UDP library. The reason why you might want to do something like this is because this gives you a much more, so sockets are super low level, and UDP is a, is a network protocol that's built on top of sockets that gives you like a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, you know, useful things. Kind of like how uh, OTP gives you useful things on top of the raw spawn, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, Gen TCP gives you even more like, capabilities because TCP is a more robust protocol than UDP. Um, but generally speaking, it looks more or less the same. And so let's go ahead and run this. And you can see uh, the initialized mutated values are exactly what we expect, right? 
Um, but in this case, the little token that we got back is a port. Uh, and what this says is that in this version of the virtual machine, the, uh, the way that UDP is implemented is actually as a port, one of those non, like, one of those weird ports that doesn't actually execute, uh, execute a, uh, another program. Um, and instead, instead of this, like, so it's not actually using the socket, the socket primitives. Um, so I believe the plan with, with, could be wrong about this, but I believe the plan, plan with the beam is to eventually move uh, uh, gen TCP and gen UDP over to sockets. Um, correct me on that if I'm wrong. Okay. So where do we rank sockets? Socket is S here. Why is it S here? Because, uh, because it is what is used under the hood to talk to databases, and pretty much everybody here is doing that, I think. But if you're talking to databases, if you're talking to Redis, if you're talking to over the internet, if you're doing an HTTP GET request, if you're doing um, if you're doing any of those sorts of things, sockets either via socket or gen TCP, gen UDP, that's like S tier. All right, next, files. This is pretty simple. It's contents on the file systems. Um, so uh, the, way, the way you could do this is to use Elixir file functions to modify files on your system. There are three different ways of, of, of doing it. Um, naive, managed, and raw. We're going to go through all three. Um, what it stores is whatever can be stored on files. Um, typically, you're going to be encoding these, again, as binaries. Uh, the big warning is that your file system might be in a container that is read-only, in which case you might not be able to do this, depending on what it has access to. Sometimes your container is set up to have access to, say, like the temporary directory. Sometimes, you know, it doesn't. Uh, consult your DevOps people. OK, so the naive way to do this is just use the file, uh, the file primitives, uh, or the file uh, module that uh, Elixir provides you. And here you have, um, so basically I'm just going to open a file and, and write to it. And the file that I'm going to open is demo. And the token that I'm going to use is literally the file name, or the file path. Um, and uh, we just use the read and the write uh, functions to get and put. So let's go and take a look at this. And at, as we expect, uh, we get something weird. Oh, file naive state. <laughs> All right, so as we can see, the reference is the path to the file. Um, and then we have, uh, and then we have um, it, the initialized mutated values, as we expect. Let's go dig one level deeper. So file gives you a way to actually open the file using uh, directly using these read and, uh, uh, read and write. So this isn't just using like, the, the read and write um, uh, functions. It's using the open function to keep open a file connection. See, when you, what's really going on is you're taking out something called a file descriptor in the operating system. And that's kind of expensive. And if you're just reading and writing, you're, you're, you're bringing that up and tearing that down each time. When you use file.open, you're keeping that file descriptor open so that you don't have to like, exercise all these resources all the time, especially if you know you're going to do more than one thing on it. But the thing to remember is that there's something weird in that the file descriptor also keeps track of like, where you are looking at in the file. So this is why if you look at this get and put functions, we have these, uh, before we do anything to it, we have to, um, we have to actually reset the location of, that we're looking at back to the beginning. So, a little bit more uh, tricky to use. One nice thing is you don't have to worry about, in, in other programming languages, you might have to worry about closing the file. You can certainly close the, close the file manually in, in, a, uh, in Elixir, but um, it will also be garbage collected. So if, that, if whatever you're holding onto uh, would normally like, uh, would, would just escape via the garbage collection system or the process dies that's holding onto it dies, don't worry. Uh, the beam's got your back. It'll clean it up for you, and you won't exhaust your resources. OK, so we already saw this one. This is this one up here. Um, and so note that the reference here is a PID. Why is that the case? Because when it, when it opens this file.open function, it actually spawns another process. And that process is what's holding on to this reference. And when you do these read and write uh, actions, it's communicating to that process executing the file operation and bringing it back. So that means that everything is serialized through this one, basically, gen server that's holding, that's holding on to it. Um, this is really useful because you can have concurrent uh, access to the files without worrying about weird things happening uh, as, as they're trying to uh, read and write. 
But suppose you can't, you're like, I can't afford that. I need to write to file super, super fast. And like, I don't want to spawn another process when I don't have to. Well, there's also like uh, this raw command that you can do. And basically, it, uh, all the code here looks pretty much the same, except we, can't, we can no longer use the IO or the uh, Elixir IO primitives. We have to really use these like, low level Erlang file, file functions. More or less the same thing, um, but these just li literally, they don't create a new gen server. Uh, to, to manage the file. So let's take a quick look at this. And you can see here, we got this file descriptor tuple, prim file with some map full of various parameters. Okay, so this, uh, this is, um, so this is, uh, this is what gets used to, um, to manage, manage this file. Um, and this is like really low level raw access and it's not gated through a single, uh, single process. It's very concurrency sensitive. Be very careful if you uh, want to do something raw, but it's fast. Uh, OK, so where do I put files? Unfortunately, I have to put files at C tier, pretty much because we're, we're tend to deploy in places where using file for as like a state storage mechanism, probably not what you want to do, right? Great for con configuration, one-time reads, you know, store something or serve it over the internet, but just don't use it for uh, for, for state. This is the next one, beam processes. OK, so what is it? It is a self-tailed called function that has been spawned into its own memory space. So, you know, um, and basically, uh, think of it as like a closure, if you are familiar with other programming languages that are functional, or, or even JavaScript. And the closure, it's closing. Uh, the, so the, the, the function is calling itself, and it's sort of like baton passing. Uh, it's baton passing like the, the contents of whatever it cares about, you know, between each iteration of the of the of the function call. And good news, your your favorite like ways of normally storing state, gen server and agent, are built on this. And the other cool thing is I can store any Elixir term. It doesn't just have to be binary. And then all the previous examples were pretty much restricted to binaries or something that we can have some sort of other procedure to like write and, and store values to. OK, so let's take a quick look at this. Um, this is actually some more, more complicated call, um, stuff. We're going to directly call the spawn function. We're going to do the most raw form of storing state in a process we can. Um, we're going to spawn this, uh, this lambda, which calls this tail call function. And the tail call blocks on a receive and handles the various messages that we can send to it. And then for get, it just responds with the, uh, with the content. And for put, um, uh, it replaces the tail call content here. So this is the, this is the baton pass step. You can see here in the get, get stage, we baton pass the same stuff back. And for the put case, we're, repla we're, swapping, we're swapping out what we're doing. OK, so let's do string demo on process state. OK, so this is exactly what you would expect. It works as we expect. But you know, of course, we can also do int demo just fine. Um, it will store and mutate the value as you expect. Um, cool. And of course, the reference that the token that we use to keep track of our state, it's going to be a PID. No surprises there. All right, so where does it go? This is A tier. Uh, I didn't quite put an S tier. Obviously, gen server is S tier, but you know, just be careful. I actually hate agent. I don't recommend using agent. Um, so <laughs> that's just one of my quirks. But, but like, uh, you know, and it's also easy to mess up, um, especially if you're doing stuff at a raw level. But you know, if you're using gen server, S tier. If you're using like, because it gives you lots of like protections and lets you do distributed stuff really easily, um, you know, there's stuff that you might not have thought of whether or not you know you need it if you're trying compared to doing it raw, doing it like as a raw, as a raw like socket or as a raw as a raw PID. Anyways, that's A tier. Okay, uh, the next one, process dictionary. So what is it? Every process also has a, a local KV storage heap. It's kind of like a little Redis living inside of every single one of your Elixir processes. You just use get and put in the process module. This actually, um, this actually forwards to like a really low-level Erlang, uh, low-level Erlang function. This is in fact the fastest way to do exactly this sort of state tracking uh, of all of these. And the reasons for that are a little subtle, but it has to do with like um, cache coherency uh, on the low level, I think. Um, 
It can store any beam term as a key and any beam term as a value. So let's take a look at the demo. Oh, and this is the one that is thread safe, but that's because, or process safe, because only one process can mutate the values in your process dictionary. So let's take a look at the code. Um, so this is pdict. Um, basically, to new, we're just going to create, we're going to use this demo key um, to, to store the content. Uh, and you'll see that that's what, uh, that's what uh, comes out at the end. Um, there, to get input, we're just going to delegate to this, the process module. And so let's take a look. So this works. And note that the reference in this case is going to be the key. So you can just access it by the key. Um, we're also going to look at do the int demo here. Um, one thing you may not know, though, is that every process can see what's in the dictionary of the other processes. And so I'm going to prove that to you with the inspect, um, uh, inspect uh, function. And so you can see that I was able to pull out, um, there's this uh, uh, global function called Erlangda process info. Um, it stores all sorts of sundry information that you might care about what's going on in your virtual machine. Um, and Sure enough, one of the things it stores about every process is what's sitting in the dictionary. So you can reach in and inspect what's in the other, other, um, other processes, like process dictionary, in a read fashion. Don't recommend doing it. Uh, don't do it unless you're like, sitting in at the terminal and like, I wonder what's going on in that process. This is a great debug tool. Highly discourage using it for any sort of production work. OK, where, where do I put PDX? Uh, that is an A tier feature. And the, part of the reason why this is A tier is because some of the things that you're used to, like uh, ecto checkouts on your tests and mocks, um, and, and like mocks being like able to run async, depend on uh, the process dictionary. Um, if you want to learn more about that, I have a talk called uh, Tasks. Uh, wait, what was it called? <laughs> uh, uh, ancestors, colors, and tasks. Oh my! Um, so check that out if you're if you're interested in how that works. But it all depends on this. Okay, seven NIFs. Oh, this is like some dangerous territory here. What 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 this is? This is low level access to the beams, memory space, and code. So basically, um, NIF function calls have access to whatever memory has been set aside in C code or whatever has been allocated, whatever you want. Um, and NIFs can also create resources, which are garbage collected terms. Um, any beam term that you can figure out how to serialize into C is what, what it stores. OK, so big warning here, don't seg fault. If you seg fault, which means you cause a certain type of crash in your, in your, C, in your C code, the whole thing comes down and you, lose, and you lose everything. You lose the world. OK, so uh, let's take a look at some NIF stuff. So this is like the most naive way. So I am the author of the Ziegler library. and. Um, this, for me, was the easiest way to like, show you how to write C-ish code. Um, I think it should be pretty legible. Pretty much everybody here should be able to understand and read, read this code, even if you're like, a beginner. But basically, I'm creating this stored variable, and then I'm going to stash like, a past variable into uh, it, the value, value passed into new into this like, stored variable, right? And then get just returns what, what was in that variable. And note how this kind of like, exists in this weird space outside. That makes it global. OK, so uh, let's take a look at this. We're going to do int demo. And we're going to do if naive. So yeah, it works. OK, um, this isn't great because this stored is completely global, right? Maybe we want something that's like a little bit like, and, and there's also note how it just totally ignored the token. We can only store one, one thing at a time. Well, you might think that one, one way to do this is to use a pointer. This is a little bit more of an advanced to uh, topic, but I'm just going to allocate some memory, and then I'm going to like stash the value in it, and then I can maybe return the integer um, that corresponds to that pointer and store that. Okay, so uh, let's do if pointer state. Okay, so that obviously works, um, but like. Uh, and, and so we've, we've literally taken this pointer, converted it to an integer, and converted it back to get the value. What's the problem with this? Anybody can think of something that could happen if you do this? 
No pointer, yeah. So suppose I change that, that pointer to zero or something else, right? Uh, that's just not, not even the same number. If I add one to it, I can wind up completely crashing everything and losing the world. So don't do this. Um, if you're fooling around with NIFs or low-level code and you want a safe way to like, store a reference, use this thing called a resource. Um, the documentation for this, uh, how to do this in other languages like REST or C, is available uh, uh, in the Erlang documentation. But this is, like, uh, this is kind of the easiest way to demonstrate this, I think. Um, so basically, I'm just going to do this create function, um, do an unpack function, and then there's an update function that I can call, and just, it just sort of like shoves this value into, into this thing called a resource. Um, and then without going into too much detail about how that works, note that this is possible. And if I execute this code, um, we're going to the same thing occurs with initialized and mutated values. Um, but what we get back is a reference. So what this is is when you create a resource, it's a garbage collected term that sort of wraps around some C code or some C values. And um, if you notice, like in a lot of the other examples, um, you get these references back. And that's because over time, the, uh, the Beam maintainers have been moving a lot of their code into NIFs. And so secretly, they are doing this sort of thing under the hood and using that to manage, manage state. Speaking of which, uh, oh yeah, so NIFs are C tier because they're really hard to use correctly and um, they have this problem where they can just destroy your entire virtual machine. So the next one is ETS. Um, what is ETS? It's a highly optimized tuple storage uh, engine. You make a table using the ETS module. You can insert tuples using insert, and you can query tuples with select. Uh, there's a bunch of different options. Set, which means that you can only have one key, a uh, one of each key. Bag, which means you can have as many of each key. There's the ordered set, which has some, some optimizations. There's disk ETS, uh, which is DETS, so, you've, so that stores it to disk. There's amnesia, which is uh, distributed ETS over the network. Um, and then a couple of modules that you definitely use all the time called ENVS and DIGRAPH. Um, so ENV is like what, you know, you store your com config ENV and all that stuff, right? Uh, and DIGRAPH, which is maybe people aren't using, but it's a, it's a um, directed graph library that's built into the, um, that's built into, uh, the beam, are, are built on top of ETS. So what does it store? It stores any tuple, and tuples with the key in the first position are privileged. Um, there you go. Uh, a couple of warnings. ETS tables are owned by a process. If that process dies, the table gets wiped. And uh, ETS tables cannot be directly accessed across a cluster. So if you have a reference to an ETS table and you try to access it on a different node, you aren't going to get anything. So, don't, so be careful. OK, so let's take a look at this. The one big problem with ETS is that it, in order to do a query on ETS, you need something called a match spec. And they're kind of ugly. Um, and so, um, so here is ETS.select, and that's what uh, pulls our data from ETS. Um, and just to show you how ugly this match spec is, I've gone ahead and inspected it. To make things easier, uh, this is what I've done. I, I pulled in this library called match spec, and it just converts this function into, like a, an, into, a, uh, into a, an ETS query. OK, so let's do ETS state. And OK, so here you can see this ugly, this ugly query. That's what that looks like. That's what this simple function gets turned into this monstrosity. Uh, um, and then, uh, but yeah, so note the reference is a, the, the token is a reference here, which it suggests that maybe it's written as a NIF under the hood. And it works as you expect. And of course, it also works with strings. OK. All right. Where does ETS go? ETS, ETS is like S tier, man. Like this is, this is, it's really fast. Um, it's concurrency optimized. There are a bunch of options. The only drawback is that you, know, you have to write these weird queries. OK, two more. I think two more. Uh, maybe three more, sorry. Atomics, uh, what is this? This is a thin abstraction over something called atomics, which exists in the CPU. Um, just gonna like you make an atomic array using this atomic.new function. You use uh, some mutation functions, put, get, exchange, CMP exchange. If those are unfamiliar to you, it's probably because th um, those are like uh, common um, uh, common words that are used uh, at sort of like the CPU level. 
You may be familiar with the module counters, um, which is a way to do concurrent, concurrently, uh, concurrent counters in the beam. That, uh, that atomic is built on top, of, on top of atomics, and you can also use atomics to make mutexes. Um, again, much like ETS, atomic arrays are owned by a process. They cannot be directly ac ac uh, accessed across a cluster, and um, they are one index, not zero, zero indexed. The last thing is it can only store 64-bit integers. OK, so state.int demo. And so you can see here, um, it's pretty straightforward. I'm just making an atomic array of just one element, and we're going to access it using the one indexed uh, one position in this atomic array. And the uh, sh uh, put stuff into it uh, function is atomics.exchange. Any guesses as to what the reference is going to be? Yes, it is a reference, because under the hood, atomics are implemented as NIFs. All right, that's all I have to say about atomics. They're, except for the fact that they are A tier. <laughs> um, they're only, the only problem with atomics, so you should be using them if you have any sort of situation where you need like counters that aren't distributed over the network. Um, they're really fast, and, uh, and, and um, the only setback is that you can only store 64-bit integers over them. OK, number 10, modules. Uh, what is it? So it's that thing that bundles your code into beam files. How does it work? You just compile a module. Like, yeah, modules are stateful, right? Like, you know, and you can replace them. Uh, and what can it store? Any term that isn't PID, port, or ref, because those are, those are transient. But everything else, you can do whatever you want. And so let's look at this really janky code. Um, so I'm going to just compile a random module, right? <laughs> And then, uh, and then um, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to register the, the content attribute here and then just do at content and then store whatever I've passed into the compile function. Get is just grabbing that, that content attribute using this double underscore info function. This is a secret function that Elixir will stash into your modules. Um, and it's got this attributes field. Um, Right. So yeah. So you may not, may, may or may not have known this, but you can hide store data in like your attributes can be like can can like wind up having you know data stored in them for the lifetime of the module. Um, but you see, you see, you got to do this persist true thing. Uh, otherwise, otherwise that those at uh, otherwise those at like fields they get thrown away. Right. So uh, don't you don't have to answer? But if anybody does, anybody see the bug here? Ooh, and no hands. OK, good. You're going to learn something. Uh, so let's do, uh, let's do int demo on module state. Uh, whoops, what happened? <laughs> Maybe it'll, it'll be more clear if I do string demo. So when you, when you register an attribute, it forces that attribute to be inside of a list. So be careful if you decide to register attributes and do weird stuff like this. OK, we have one more. Oh, before we do this, uh, use the state. This is F tier, because don't do this. Just, just please, please. Code review should get you if you do this. All right, uh, persistent term. This is the last one. Um, this is also the newest one to the Erlang uh, virtual machine. What is it? It's a special KV store. Think of it as like a dedicated ETS table, shared memory, fast access. But the, it's like super weird because, um, because it, it's actually like the, the, the terms that you get out are not actually like, they're not actually terms like everything else. They go straight to like this memory, this weird memory space in, in the beam. And then what happens is you can delete, you can delete these terms, right, from the, t from the, from the persistent term table. And if you delete those terms, it triggers a full garbage collection sweep of the virtual machine and swaps out, the, swaps out any, any process that's holding on to this term with the actual value instead of this like pseudo value. That's just a memory, memory location in the persistent term table. Now, if that sounds really complicated, don't worry about it. Don't, don't use it. <laughs> but uh, just to show you the code, um, here's what it looks like. Get and put just are forwarded to persistent term, which has the persistent term Erlang style module, which has get and put functions. Um, 
And then, uh, you know, in this case, I'm going to just put, I'm going to make my own reference to, to, like, to store as the key, but it could be anything. Your key could be whatever you want it to be. So let's just go ahead and do a string demo on persistent term space. And then, so that works. And then if we do int demo, you can see that that also works. Um, again, be very careful because if you ever do that put operation, which you didn't see because this is such a minimal demo, is that it is doing a full GC, GC sweep across the entire virtual machine. OK, um, so this unfortunately gets C tier. It's definitely useful for a certain like, configuration that you may want to like, change on the fly, but uh, probably not, not a good choice for your run of the mill uh, things. I think it's possible that some of the application terms, uh, application configs might start moving over to persistent term, but uh, you didn't hear that from me. Okay, in summary, there are a lot of ways of keeping state in the beam. Uh, pick the right one for your use case. For some of them, never use them, <laughs> but just be aware that like, what you're doing in general on the VM is, can be stateful. Um, the take home is that beam languages, including Elixir, are generally not pure. Uh, you know, so we're not, we're not like in Haskell land or anything like that. Functional programming for Beam languages are, is strictly for your convenience and to give you low cognitive overhead. But do be careful when you're doing something that might be stateful because you can foot your gun yourself. So in the 99% of the case, you got low cognitive overhead and then just be careful with the rest of it. This code will eventually be up on this website uh, that I have below. Um, so uh, enjoy, and have a good lunch, everyone. Thank you.